Hello, everybody. Welcome to Talk About Houses. I'm Todd. I'm Juana. Okay, so today we're going to sort of take two topics, roll them into one, and have an interesting discussion about housing in the U.S. and what that's going to look like as our population grows, and then what it looks like now in Japan with the declining population. It's a very interesting topic. Uh, obviously, the population growth or uh, declining factor is very influential regarding real estate values, so right. it's going to be a very interesting、uh, discussion. Okay, so we're going to start with the Japan side of the equation. Of course, Japan has a population decline for two reasons. One is they have a negative birth rate. What does that mean? It means that they are not having sufficient babies to replace the people that are dying. And then they have very tough immigration rules. They do. They are very,、um, very concerned with protecting their culture and protecting their way of life. And one of the ways that they、uh, protect that is by limiting the amount of immigration that they allow. Okay, so here's an article、uh, from Bloomberg. It says, Want a fixer upper in Japan? You could nab one of millions of country houses for sale for just $25,000.、Uh, so we'll talk about this a little bit.、Uh, we actually watched a video of somebody on YouTube who bought one of these for. Pretty cheap,、mm -hmm. and then spent, I think, for $70,000, and then spent like $150K in rehab.、Mm -hmm. Okay, but there's some problems with this. So, what are these country homes? <laughs> Where are these things? So,、uh, clearly, they are not in major metropolitan areas. They are out in the country.、Uh, they are、uh, in rural areas.、Uh, sometimes they are、uh, they belong to farmers, they belong to you know, people、uh, in the village, and that sort of thing. And the, the issue with them is, is multifold. First of all,、um, the, the, the previous owners have generally passed away and they don't have any family、um, to take over the, the property. And then, of course, there's the issue of services, right? These are, these are homes that, like I said, they are for our purposes,、um, for those of us that are urban、uh, or suburban,、uh, they are out in the middle of nowhere. So if you have a job in the city, then that, this may not be for you, right? Because now you're going to have to drive to the train station and then take the train into the city. And you know, that could be an、right. hour long ride, you know, whatever, however that looks like. The other thing is that these homes are, do not have the、um, amenities that we are accustomed to、mm -hmm. in, in cities. Like central anything. Right, like central anything. So they don't have central heat, central cooling,、um, internet access. <laughs> internet access. They don't have a lot of things. Right. Uh, you know, and they, they're very simple for the most part.、Um, so they don't have a lot of the features that we are accustomed to, you know, in, as、right. far as the, the kitchens are concerned and the bathrooms are concerned and that sort、right. of thing. So it,、uh, they it, have single pane windows. Sorry, they have、yeah. single pane windows.、Uh, th there's not a lot of insulation. So it, it's, it's much more complicated than, oh, we're just buying a country house. So that's something to keep in mind. Not only that, but there, there, there's very little to no economic opportunity in the, in the vicinity. And I realize that lots of people are working remotely.、Uh, but you may work remotely, but maybe you want a little more than nothing around you forever and ever.、Uh, so, you know, if you want services like,、uh, like stores or entertainment or restaurants, that's going to be an issue as well. So it's, it's a lifestyle、um, concern as well.、Um, another. Think from the article says Japan has a glut of abandoned homes in rural areas and small towns.、Mm -hmm. And sort of like Juan has said, you know, this is the natural you know, change in demographics、mm -hmm. from a, a community, from a, a country that had a lot of farming、mm -hmm. that was spread out.、Mm -hmm. But now they have more efficient farming. They use less people and they do it in more concentrated areas, right? Right. So you, you've taken this society that, that has been an agrarian society, and the young people have all gone to the cities, and who were left were the old people. And of course, as the old people are passing away,、uh, there's no one left for, to occupy these houses out in the country or in the small villages. Right.、Um, so we're gonna, we'll read this article. This is from, uh, uh, this is from Business Insider. Uh, I had to go to a couple sources to get all the information. Japan is a glut of older abandoned homes in rural areas, as insiders previously reported. With the country's population in decline, there simply aren't enough people willing to purchase these houses. Now, that doesn't mean that the rest of the, like, of real estate in Japan is collapsing.、Mm -hmm. It absolutely isn't. Because remember, these are in areas no one wants to be in anyway. Like, if a new home builder went 
out in the middle of you know nowhere and built a bunch of houses that didn't have access to they built a million houses, but there are no power, there's no water, there's nothing. Like they still wouldn't do anything, right? Wouldn't move the needle. Right. I mean, you know, there are lots of small towns all over the US that would face something similar um, if if all the young people moved away, right? And and the, all all that was left with were the older people, and there was no one to replace them. They would face yeah. the same um, the, the same fate. Okay, uh, the country has at least eight point five million such IKEA, the Japanese word for unoccupied home, mm -hmm. uh, according to government data from twenty eighteen. Some experts believe there's as many as eleven million empty houses with owners of these traditional homes die. Those who inherit the properties often don't want them or are unable to maintain them. Mm -hmm. In Japan, land remains valuable while the houses lose value over time and are often torn down and rebuilt. So, okay, so Japan has a, a, this problem, not enough immigration mm -hmm. and... Uh, declining birth rate. Declining birth rate. Mm -hmm. So their population is declining. Now that that's fine if people become more productive. They can support their population with less people with through technology, through all these other things. But, you know, obviously that leaves this land and real estate sort of in shambles. Now, we'll, so we're going to flip the coin here a little bit, talk about the U.S., okay? Because we do have parts of the country that are in population decline. Right. Even though we have a positive birth rate in the U.S., mm -hmm. okay? And we have net immigration. Mm -hmm. Very few people leave, but more people, far more people come than leave, right? Mm -hmm. But why do we have, we have parts of the U.S. now that have, they lose population. Right. So why, why is that? Why do areas like, what well, would know, cause a town to disappear? What would cause a region of the country to just have people want to get out of there? Right. So, so in the U.S., um, so much of our lives revolve around economics, right? Okay. So, you know, that will happen when, um, when there's a, a company town, as, as they used to be called, right, where maybe um, there was a coal mine, and the coal mine was the town. And the coal mine is uh, g closes down, and then the town basically disappears along with the coal mine. And it's the same thing with all kinds of other industries that um, that disappear, whether it's because they've relocated somewhere else or because that industry is obsolete, whatever the reason. So we do have lots of towns that that happens to. Uh, you know, not so much now, but it, about 40 years ago, that used to happen uh, with farming communities. As the um, as as we went from individually owned farms to corporate farms, there was a lot of that too. Because now all of a sudden, you didn't need as many people to farm the land, and uh, you know the all, the communities got significantly smaller. Okay. Now let's talk about. But so we have these houses. We probably have houses in some of those areas that are probably. You know, if you leave a house and don't take care of it, mm -hmm. stuff starts to go bad really quick. It's not like you can just go to a house that no one's been in for two years, walk in, and a lot of times there's a problem. Like, because you get the water gets put back on and you have leaks mm -hmm. and stuff, right? Or Right. And remember, you know, uh, Japan does uh, have uh, extreme temperatures as far as the, uh, the summers are hot and the winters are cold. So so you do have the that problem with uh, expansion, contraction, you do have, you have the, the moisture problem. Um, as far as roofs leaking and um, pipes freezing and that sort of thing. So you have all those issues. Plus, remember, these are homes that were built a very long time ago. And they are, like I said before, they're, they're maybe functionally obsolete. They've got single-pane windows. They don't have central heat. They don't have central cooling. So there are a lot of issues with them. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is put up the census. This is from the mm -hmm. Census Bureau. Okay. Now, this, is, this data was tabulated in 2016. Mm -hmm. It's a projection, but it's still pretty accurate because... Um, if you look at the 2020 number, we were pretty close to that in the 2020 census. So you have this population growth that's happening in the U.S., okay? And so 323 million in 2016, 2020 was 332, 2030 estimates 355. We're in between those two numbers now, right? Because we're between 2020 and 2030. 2040, 375. Then you notice it tapers off a little bit. It doesn't go up by like 20,000 every, you know, 10 years. It, it, it goes up maybe a million. It goes up maybe 16 million. And the reason is, is because this weird thing happens in 2042. It's the inflection point currently estimated where the U.S. goes to a negative birth rate. Mm -hmm. So this is where the U.S. goes to a negative birth rate. 
China actually has this problem, I think, around 2050. It starts to go to a negative birth rate, okay? But 2042, we're expected to go to a negative birth rate. So what they've done is they've taken in the negative birth rate into account and then just assumed immigration stays the same. Mm -hmm. So we have 16 million people that move here every 10 years or something from other countries So to replace people, to add people and then replace people that die. Right. Which, which is probably pretty accurate. It, it probably is pretty accurate because it not only is, <clears throat> is our birth rate declining, but it's declining, declining in a lot of other places all over the earth. So, so the idea that our immigration wouldn't be substantially higher to make up for the negative birth rate is probably not, um, not feasible because, like I said, it's very likely that a lot of the places that we get um, our immigration from will also experience a negative birth rate. Yeah, there are some certainly some places, but there are other places in the world that are predicted to grow. Right. Okay, so the idea is that... Well, you know, so, yes, they are predicted to grow, but but you have to kind of look at, look at it, um, I think, more broadly than that. Because, yes, they are predicted to grow because uh, their economies will get better and they'll have more uh, food security and uh, maybe they'll... Um, maybe there won't be as many wars and that sort of thing. So I'll agree with that. But you also have to understand that as a country becomes more developed, um, as women are, um, as women enter the workforce and as they become a greater part of the workforce, women choose to um, either delay having children or completely forego having children. And same thing with men. You know, men may not feel um, as compelled to have children at all, or at least have larger families. Right. So this is something very complicated because we've seen this happen as, um, as society changes. That's, part, that's a lot of the reason why the birth rates drop. Okay. So you're probably saying, this is, real, like this is a real estate channel. Why are we talking about We're, population? Because it's important. Remember household formations, people needing a roof over their head. Well, how many of those, right? Right. And and that and that's what we're we're getting to. We're getting to the housing part. Okay. In two thousand six seven time frame, this thing happened. It was the it was a housing crash basically, mm -hmm. and a lot of home builders overbuilt. The builders got wiped out. A lot of them did. A lot of them scaled back. Some went out of business. But a lot of the people that were in the that were doing all the work had to get new careers because construction just disappeared in the U.S. So they went and they changed fields and they decided not to come back to construction. They went to some other thing, right? Went to college or just got another job and decided they didn't want to build homes anymore, do whatever. So we went to this period of the last 15 years where we've severely underbuilt homes. We're averaging six to 700,000 new homes built a year. The problem is we're creating new households at a far greater rate. So the difference in the last 15 years between homes built and household formations is 6.5 million, which is the estimate for how many homes, single family homes that were short. So there's a couple things that are all happening at the same time, okay? So let's start with the first one. If the population increases, let's say by 2050, and we add another 50 to 60 million people, <laughs> At the current building rate, we're not even going to build 20 million houses. Right. And remember, even the houses that we have, they are not all habitable. Uh, they will not all continue to be habitable. Okay. And they are not all desirable. So what I mean by that is, uh, so let's, you know, let's talk about houses that were built prior to maybe 1985. Um, so these are going to be homes that have uh, lower ceilings, you might have three or four bedrooms and maybe only one or at most two baths. Uh, I realize that a lot of them have been renovated and updated, but some haven't. So um, so th that there's a, a certain amount of functional obsolescence in these homes. Not only that, but we have homes maybe in places where we don't need them. Like we just said that we, we've got, we also have uh, entire towns that are uh, basically empty because you know, like I said, mines have closed or industry has moved. Okay. And, and so those are vacant houses that, that we do have here in the U.S. So there are a lot of houses in the U.S. that need to be either um, completely uh, updated and renovated or flat out torn down. And 
so they they are considered part of the housing stock right now so if we were to remove those then we would probably uh, estimate that we our housing shortage is even greater than the current estimate and, and remember this estimate of homes built include it's not just a brand new home on a new piece of dirt it's a home built meaning the numbers you see from the national association of home builders in, not only uh, include these home builders who build subdivisions but they're privately built homes they count those homes and it's actually like one in six homes is is privately built so it's not just kb homes and you know all these other home builders building it's you know somebody has a house that was built in the 30s or 40s and it's on a quarter acre in socal but it's three bedrooms one bath mm -hmm. and they decide you know what i'm going to buy the house tear it down and build my you know, 3,000 square foot, really nice house and build it right here. Um, modern, update everything. It counts as, so we're, we're, we're sort of uh, uh, cannibalizing our own housing supply because it's the land that's that really valuable, it's not the house. And, and of course we do have houses every year, you know, 140 million single family homes every year get one year older. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we do have a large industry that comes and remodels and does homes. But in the midst of this, as we're moving forward, we're probably going to find more and more homes function, functionally obsolescent. So one of two things is going to happen. We're either going to have to just build more high rises and units that just put people that were, they're not in a single family home. Right. But bottom line one is what becomes, what happens to land? Because you can't just say, Oh, well we, we could just build further out because you can't always just build for like San Diego is a perfect example. You can't build West. Well, not only, Pacific Ocean. Not only that, that um, land is a, is a scarce resource, but also consider that people want to live near economic activity and that uh, bringing services like sewer and electricity and so on out, you know, further out, that's also expensive. So that's why a lot of times you see uh, people purchase uh, a house and maybe a house that has been recently renovated and updated and they will tear it down and they will start again because it was the land that was valuable not the house the house was maybe built in the 50s 60s 70s or even the 80s but that isn't the house that that people want so it'll get torn down and they'll start it they'll start fresh because the land is valuable and the services to, to that land and of course that land's location because this is real estate it's all about location 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 <laughs> and then the other thing that's to take no account to is if you look over the last 10, 20, 30 years where home values have gone up the most, they've gone up in the West mm -hmm. because of economic activity. Mm -hmm. the, you know, California has been successful with industry, with especially with tech and with just general industry. You know, it's like the sixth or seventh largest economy in the world just on its own. The South has been substantially improved because of manufacturing that's shifted down there and other industry that's moved aviation things like that that have moved to the south of course you have now have florida is very popular not only for people retiring because remember when those even the retire people what do they bring with them they bring these pensions <laughs> and now they have money to spend even though they don't produce anything they they desire services they need health services so you have to build hospitals and they require housing and golf courses and all this stuff and food so you have to provide these services to people so you have this economic shift in the country so you know if i was investing all over the country i would probably just basically the sun belt i would just say hey i'm going to invest in only the stuff in the sun belt i don't know that i would go up to fargo north dakota and go say i'm going to go buy some investment properties up there because you know you know i don't know what's going to happen i don't know if fargo is going to get a tesla factory or something and maybe it's going to boom but that's an outlier i know that the the southern states and the southwest part of the u.s and parts of the west coast are probably going to do pretty well so the whole idea here is that you know we've been had this discussion for the last year about why the housing market hasn't crashed you've seen the numbers they're very benign now i did watch a youtube YouTube video of a guy who literally tried to say that these people are buying a house for 600,000. It just last year sold for 800,000. Now, I don't believe that's the case. I think they're saying it, it maybe it could have been, if someone paid 800,000 for this house is now worth 600,000. So 25% decline, that's not the whole market. Um, maybe they overpaid, maybe it was a fraud or something like that. But the, the whole point is we're talking about like why is something valuable or valuable over time 
And if you own land or a property that is in an area of population growth, that is probably a good long-term investment. Mm -hmm. So if you're in the front range of Colorado, where three of the top 10 counties in the front range is just right east of the mountains, right? Denver, Fort Collins, Colorado Springs, that area. Or if you're in parts of Texas or you're in Florida or you're in you know, Vegas, Phoenix, parts of SoCal, San Diego, places like that. Um, those areas seem to be doing very well. And those areas will likely do well into the future because of this phenomena we talked about. Because we don't know, honestly, nobody knows what home values are going to be in a year, right, or two. All we know is we what we think we collect in rent, right? Right. We know... What we know for sure is that over time, real estate appreciates. Uh, the road might be a little bumpy along the way, but over the long term, real estate appreciates. And we, we know almost certainly we will have an, a, a, a improving population for at least the next 50 years, which is going to be most of our lifetimes, unless you're very young watching this video. Most of us over the next 50 years, we'll not see decline in the U.S. population. We'll have a need for more everything, more housing, more, you know, you name it. But we're not making any more land and potentially we're concentrating more. Like Juan has said, people want to live near amenities. They want to be in a city with stuff, you know. The, right. No one has gone to, like no big companies have moved to, you know, McAllen, Texas <laughs> to, you know, make semiconductors or whatever. Right? Where did a Tesla go? They went to Austin because it's a you know it's a decent sized city. And there's a lot to do there. They have a university and they have a big population base and a lot of potential people that could become workers. You know they went to Northern Nevada outside of Reno to build a big massive factory out there. Of course, the state gave them a you know a thing for that. Where did all the tech companies go when they left? Well, a lot of them went to Miami mm -hmm. because Miami's fun and it's <laughs> nice weather. And there was a critical mass down there, and it was relatively super inexpensive, probably a quarter. I remember a, um, a startup that we invested in, the founder went down there, and literally for a quarter of the price, he got a high-rise living thing that he would have paid in San Francisco for about a quarter of the price. Right. And he oh, basically, oh, when he walks down his balcony, he just looks at the, you know, the Brickle, which is this area that's really heavily... Um, uh, it's very trendy. It's trendy, but it's a lot of startups. And we work is there and all that. So that it's it and it's there's just it's super, we we spent a whole almost a whole week there. It was super nice, wasn't it? It was. It was very nice. It was like oh, this, I could see why you'd want to live here. We didn't see like when you go to San Francisco and they have open air drug markets. You didn't see that in Miami, right? <laughs> so what I'm saying is these areas, unless a hurricane comes through and takes it all out, this will these areas will tend to be more valuable. So. My philosophy always been, I don't know or care what the house is going to be worth next year. I don't know or care what's going to be in two years. I care what's going to be worth in 10 or 20 years at some point when this, you know, this thing gets turned back into cash or someone inherits it or something else. Um, so I just thought that was interesting, you know, because I saw about Japan and then I started, we started making these comparisons. We did actually spend quite a bit of time sort of researching this and talking about it between us so we could present this to you in uh, an interesting way. Wanna what like are your final thoughts about this? About how our country because we know we pretty much know we're gonna have more people coming in and we know we're not gonna build enough houses to house them. Regardless of what happens short term, oh but what if there's a recession? That's the big one. That's the new one. Todd all the economists agree there's gonna be a recession. And when there's a recession, everyone loses their jobs, everyone's forced to sell the housing market tanks and you should not buy a house right now. You should wait six months because there'll be half the price. Well, they said that last year. And right. So I, I heard actually somebody say that today. I heard somebody say that we are in a reception, that um, job losses are um, are amassing, which, you know, I I completely understand. We do have that in the news all the time. You know, um, was it Facebook is laying off 4,000 people? So that there's there are job losses. That, so I'm not disputing that at all. But they're also job creations. You know, we, we're in a we're in this really um, unique point in time, and where technology is advancing at an astronomical rate, and a lot of the people that are being displaced are actually people in the technology world. And when people are displaced, they have one of two choices: they can go out and be an employee for someone else, 
or they can go ahead and start their own company. And so we're, we're, we're seeing a lot of technology um, improve by leaps and bounds right now, but as these layoffs are happening, we're going to see even more innovation because a lot of these people will innovate on their own. So it'll be really interesting to see how all of these issues are dealt with going forward uh, using innovation, using technology, and it'll be interesting to see how that impacts housing. Uh, will these people, you know, go out and live in rural areas and take over some of these um, these towns that have uh, have been laying there like Sleeping Beauty all these years? Uh, will they stick around uh, urban areas? How will they change real estate uh, as we know it? Because all of these changes that are happening, they will impact real estate. Now, as far as people who are being laid off, being forced to sell. You know, some will choose to sell because they want to relocate somewhere else. Uh, some will will stay in their homes. Um, everybody's situation is different. As, as far as being forced to sell, we've talked about this before. Everyone needs a roof over their head, so people have to live somewhere. They may choose to sell the property so they can get into a less expensive rental, so maybe you know, if they're in a $5 million home, maybe they want to downsize to a $2 million home. Okay, fair enough. Um, that I, I can understand that. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that they're forced to sell. They're choosing to sell. They're making a financial decision. Uh, and they're not going to sell the house for less than what it's worth. They're going to come up with a price that they're willing to accept and a buyer is willing to pay. That's what, you know, that, that's how economics works. Uh, I'm not expecting fire sales. So if you're thinking that you're going to get this smashing deal from, from these people that are getting laid off, think again, uh, because that's highly unlikely. I mean, we'll, are there the occasional deals? In every market. But are they going to be uh, lots of short sales, lots of uh, foreclosures, and lots of fire sales? Mm, probably not. No, there's not, not because right now there's no pre foreclosures, mm -hmm. and it takes a year from when the people when the notice of defaults and the missed payments start happening. Here's the other thing: think about this just pragmatically and realistically. You have a house that you have a two point seven five percent interest rate. You're not going to sell that thing. Why would you sell it? Rent it out. Put the extra money in your pocket and go find in, in your pocket and go find an apartment to live in. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I lost my job. Darn it. Oh, if only I had an asset that was worth a ton of money that produced income, I could just, oh, it's my house. Or you just stay in the house and make the payment. You figure out a way to make payment. Uh, there, there have been two to 300,000 jobs produced every month for the last year. And right. that's the reason why last year when they said tech, we're in a technical recession because, oh, the in, yield curve's in, inverted and we had two quarters of negative growth, which was minus 0.1% and what, but we, we added jobs. So the economy shrank a little or however it's measured shrank. But remember we keep changing how we measure the economic growth every couple of years. So this whole thing of how we measure it or how we, what, what a recession is and a recession doesn't mean everyone loses their jobs in most recessions in deep recessions in unemployment goes up by 5%. Right. One in twenty people, but we're not right. anywhere close to that, and we're still we we're still at this point where we're adding jobs. So I don't believe that in today's world, with so many people, and the numbers ninety nine percent of all homes have less than six percent mortgage. That didn't none of the previous recessions was that the case. Right, none of them. And then keep in mind that um, standards have changed. So the way the banks do business have changed. So people who lose their job, they're going through an economic hardship. They call up the bank and they say, hey, uh, I'm going through a tough time. I need some help. They'll work something out with them. Banks are not interested in foreclosing. They are interested in working something out. Now, if people bury their heads in the sand, yes, they will be foreclosed. Okay, that, that's a given. So if you're one of those people that's having a hard time, or if that happens to you in the future, please do not bury your head in the sand. Please communicate with your lender. And you know, are they the easiest bunch to communicate with? No, they're like the government, okay? They're hard to communicate with. But if you're persistent, you can work something out. You can work out a loan modification. They can 
Um, they, they can hold your payments in abatement and put them on the back end. They can do all kinds of things to help you out. They are not interested in foreclosing on you. They are interested in working things out with you because it's better for them. It's more profitable for them. It, they're not being altruistic. It's just more profitable. So understand that and understand that you can work with your lender. Here's the, here's the bottom line. You cannot paint the landscape of what's happening today with what it would have been like on, in, the, in the 1983 recession. Because it's, in the 1983 recession, those people had 16% interest rates on their house. And if they lost their job, if they just walked away from the house. Mm -hmm. They're just like, I have a 60% interest rate and I'm just out of here, right? Well, and, and there weren't the mechanisms for, for workouts. Right. Um, the other so thing it, too is we have people, have because jobs have changed to more technical jobs, when you hear, oh my gosh, Facebook just lost these people. Trust me, those people all have jobs. If you have, if you have Facebook on your resume, somebody else, look, there are other companies that are trying to hire people, but they can't because Facebook hired them all. Mm -hmm. So there are other companies that are going to be hiring all these people. These, you know, people don't lose their job. And then that's like, that was it. That's the only job I was allowed to hold for my whole life. I'm, I can't do anything now, especially tech workers. It's been all tech companies that are laying off people. And these people are all getting other jobs. They're, they're skilled. Uh, they're relatively young. So they're, they're more flexible. So they have a lot of potential to do great things. Their lives are not over. <laughs> yeah, this, the whole argument's ridiculous. So we're going to find out here when we get the recession and then we see what actually you know, comes of it. And then the other argument was, okay, we're in a recession, but home prices have gone up two months in a row nationwide. January, February, February, March, home prices have gone nationwide. How's that possible if people are losing their jobs? Shouldn't they already be stopping their payments and, and just foreclosing on themselves? They should just walk down to the courthouse and go, hey guys, I'm foreclosing on myself because I, <laughs> I just lost my job and I can't make my $1,200 a month mortgage payment. So I'm going to foreclose, let the house bank take the house bank, take all the equity and keep it. And I'm just going to go rent a house for $2,400 because I can afford that. I can afford to rent for $2,400. Can I afford this $1,200 mortgage without a job? Right. So was this interesting? Um, we, we covered a lot of interesting topics, topics that we've been discussing for, um, for the last few hours and, and we enjoyed our own discussion. So we thought we'd share it with you. How was it? Did you like it? We hope you did. Uh, we are marching along toward our 1000th, um, episode. Yeah, we have like 14 left or something, yes. 13 or 14. Left. So we're marching along. So please, uh, please join us. Uh, please subscribe and hit notification bell so you can march along with us and uh, make it to 1,000 with us. We, we would appreciate it. I think yeah. it'll be fun. Uh, please leave us some comments. Tell us what you think. There, um, there's a whole bunch of economic news coming out this week, uh, and we are aware of that, and we will um, read up on it as it comes out, and we'll do videos, and we'll talk about it, and we'll have conversations with you in the, note, in the, in the comments. So uh, we'll see you on the next video. Bye. Bye.